putting this particular program uh, together. It said, uh, the long 60s heritage history and memory. The object of this project is to examine the social, economic and political history of the turbulent period encompassed by the long 60s, beginning with the development of relations between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland in the aftermath of World War II, and concluding with the Summer Deal Agreement and the Ulster Workers Council strike of 1974. Uh, the process of engagement across a range of identities and allegiances is aimed at creating opportunities to solicit contemporary responses from individuals and their communities of interest as to how they were affected by the events of the period in question. The individuals, groups and organisations involved will be invited to outline any perceived omissions in the research and provide their corrective to the historical record at a series of project workshops, seminars, with the aim of separating opinion from the historical evidence and the mythology from the reality. Uh, you're all welcome, I says, to uh, the talk uh, here today. And now, uh, if I may, I'd like to, uh, to give a short uh, introduction biographies of uh, the guest speaker and our uh, 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 guest panelists today as well. Uh, Arlen Edwards has been a senior lecturer in Defence and International Affairs at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst since 2008. Uh, he, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, Arlen was awarded his PhD by Queen's University in Belfast in 2006. He's the author of several books, some of them very expensive for me, I say, uh, A History of the Northern Ireland Labour Party, Democratic Socialism and Sectarianism, uh, Bad Mitch, Tribal Law, Eden and the End of Empire, and War, A Beginner's Guide, uh, and his most recent publication, UVF, Behind the Mosque. Uh, Sean Farron, qualified as a teacher, uh, uh, born and educated in Dublin, qualified as a teacher, and has taught in Sierra Leone in Africa, Switzerland, and Ireland. Appointed lecturer of the School of Education at New, New, the New University of Ulster in 1970. He joined the SDLP and was elected to its executive in 1974 and became chair in 1980. He stood as a, uh, a candidate on several occasions in North Antrim and won a seat in the Assembly several times. Uh, he became one of the SDLP's negotiating team and participated in several inter-party talks. Uh, after the Good Freddie Belfast Agreement, became a minister in the power sharing executive 1999 to 2002. Uh, Sean is also an author of uh, several books, uh, The SDLP, The Struggle for Agreement in Northern Ireland, John Hume and His Own Words, uh, 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 past the settlement, the politics of Irish education. He is currently a visiting professor at the School of Education at the Ulster University. He's married with four adult children and five grandchildren. Uh, Sean Brennan uh, is a visiting research fellow at Queen's University, Belfast School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics. His PhD focused on the challenges of reintegrating loyalist ex-combatants in this post-ceasefire space and as a case study to the, the, the critique Liberal Peace. He has worked in the community uh, sector uh, since the 1990s in a variety of roles. Uh, Jim Wilson is uh, born and bred in, uh, in East Belfast. Uh, Jim's uh, uh, connection to this particular uh, event that's going to be going into a day was in 1974. Uh, Jim was one of the few remaining loyalist internees, uh, and I think uh, uh, a perspective uh, coming from that regard should be extremely interesting uh, indeed. What prisoners who uh, found themselves in prison as a result of the conflict at that particular time, what they were actually talking about in the compound uh, 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 in Long Cash. 
John Will Power was born and raised in West Belfast. Uh, he's been uh, a lifelong uh, <coughs> Republican with a family whose connection with Republicans, Republicanism stretches back uh, several generations. Uh, a, a big influence on Sean's uh, political value system were the years he spent in London and England in the 1960s where he came into contact with uh, radical labour politics uh, uh, in that whole uh, uh, period in the 1960s. Uh, the direct connection Sean has with this particular uh, event in 1974 is that uh, Sean stood as a non-sectarian uh, uh, candidate for the Republican Club in the Assembly elections of 1974. Uh, so again, hopefully I've, I've set the scene here for, uh, uh, and again our uh, facilitator, uh, probably chair for uh, today's uh, uh, proceedings will be Martin Snowden, that ma 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 uh, uh, many of you know, a good friend of the uh, Machines Project, uh, going back a, right from the start basically, back in the, uh, and uh, uh, previous uh, to that when we were at one stage, reluctant guests for Majesty, and I uh, think we uh, had the opportunity to engage in uh, exchanges about uh, who we were, where we where, where were at, and more importantly, where we would be going. But again, I don't want to take up any more time. Uh, the Aaron is going to, uh, yeah, the keynote speaker, and he's going to address uh, 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 you today here with. Uh, his uh, uh, presentation uh, for today's uh, uh, workshop, The Road to Sunningdale, a new Ulster Worker Council strike of 1974. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thanks very much, Harry. And uh, I'd like to thank the Fellowship of the Medines and also the Swan Heritage Centre for uh, facilitating this uh, talk today. Uh, the 1970s are uh, a period that fascinated me for a long time. I haven't actually thought about the 1970s in, in a few years, and this was a good opportunity to come back and look at uh, that period, um, and also uh, a period that I have written extensively about. It's obviously the 1960s and the sort of descent into the conflict. Um, and that's what I'll, I'll talk about in, uh, during the course of this um, this particular engagement on the Sunningdale Agreement and the UWC strike. So uh, my intention is uh, to speak for about, what, 40, 45 minutes? Um, and I've got some uh, pictures, photographs and documents that I want to show uh, on the uh, screen. So uh, that, that's um, kind of the intention. Uh, and... Uh, I might as well get on with it. The 1970s, I tend to think of as a period when uh, the uh, conflict was at its height. And for most people who were born, I was born in 1980. Looking back in the 1970s, even, even as, as a historian, you tend to think that um, there was really no end uh, in sight. Um, but interestingly, uh, that period, 1974, there was a, a glimmer of hope. Uh, uh, at least um, for a short period of time. And one of the questions that I tried <coughs> to address when I was looking at this topic is just why the Protestant working class mobilised in support of a strike in May 1974, which had as its central objective the desire to bring down the Sunningdale Agreement and to force fresh elections to the Northern Ireland Assembly. So that's, for me, you know, the, the way in to looking at this uh, period. And um, I, I have to say, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't given much choice uh, in terms of the, the topic. Um, so I didn't actually formulate the uh, title. And so what I did was I went back and I looked at the reasons why um, Sunningdale um, failed and, and also why the Ulster, Council, uh, the Ulster Workers' Council strike brought it down. Uh, and what I found was that um, it wasn't just loyalist paramilitaries that mobilised. At that time, in fact, uh, it was a broad section of the Protestant community that um, 
really disagreed with the fundamental basis of Sunningdale. Uh, and um, as it became clear uh, in the various votes within the Unionist Party that the Unionist Party itself, led by Brian Faulkner, wasn't convinced either. So uh, it's it's intriguing, really, when you go back and look at the the evidence that you see more clearly why the thing didn't um, uh, didn't produce a power sharing executive. And often, uh, for you know the general public, when they're engaging with a topic like, topic like this, uh, when the media are engaging with a topic like this, they tend to see it as a missed opportunity. I don't think it was a missed opportunity at all. In fact, Gordon Gillespie, who's written most as a historian of the UWC strike, and someone who engaged and interviewed Glenny Barr um, before um, Glenn sadly passed away, uh, is of the opinion that it wasn't a missed opportunity. So that's really what I want to try and get to the heart of. <coughs> Why did people mobilise to bring this thing down? So the talk is going to be in three parts. The first part explores the nature of the violence on the streets uh, and the British, the British government's attempts to stop that. Uh, from the fall of the Stormont government in March 1972 to the tripartite talks convened at Sunningdale in Berkshire in December 1973, a mere train stop away from Sandhurst. Uh, Sunningdale mapped out the government's policy uh, in relation to power sharing between unionists and nationalists and so it's important to examine the logic which underpinned these negotiations. The second part of the talk focuses on the strike itself and the consequences for the success of the stoppage and what it had, that the consequences it had for both the organisers and their supporters. And the final section looks at the legacy of Sunning Deal and the strike uh, in light of recent attempts to reanimate power sharing. I argue that lessons from the past can help us understand the current political impasse in Northern Ireland, and hopefully that will lead to uh, you know, good um, uh, discussion in the question and answer session and the panel session. So, uh, I'm sure all of you will be aware of the backstory to this, but I think it's important just to run through a little potted history of the outbreak of the conflict uh, in the summer of 1969, which have been building up for many years. Uh, despite the failure of the IRA's border campaign in 1956-62, the organisation was widely believed, certainly by loyalists, uh, to be planning a return to violence to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the Easter Rising in 1966. Although no threat emerged, there were various sources. You can look back at the newspapers, you can look back at government uh, intelligence reports, and you can see that they believed that a threat was coming um, and it was coming in 1966. Um, what happened then is certain unionist politicians adjudicated in the formation of the Ulster Volunteer Force, UVF, in late 1965, and they carried out uh, sporadic attacks in 1965. In fact, one of the early um, attacks was in Rathcoole, where I uh, hail from, uh, and of course, uh, uh, in 1966, in the summer of 1966, with uh, the killing of Peter Ward on Auburn Street. Three years later, in 1969, the UVF re-emerged to carry out uh, bombings of key installations across the province and effectively bombed Terence O'Neill, uh, the Liberal Unionist uh, Prime Minister, out of office. At that time, <coughs> O'Neill faced challenges on two fronts. First, from the UVF and its sister organisation, the Ulster Protestant Volunteers, and second, from the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association, um, which had initiated protest marches uh, against uh, discrimination in jobs, housing and employment. Confrontation with the Royal Ulster Constabulary, the RUC, soon followed in B Specials, leading inevitably to sectarian clashes between Protestants and Catholics. Overwhelmed by the sheer scale of civil disturbances, the RUC called in the army. So the army deployed on the 14th and 15th of August 1969. Over the next two and a half years, they mounted uh, large scale high profile operations such as the Falls Road curfew of June 1970, internment without trial in August 1971, and of course uh, the fateful confrontation with civil rights marchers uh, in Derry, uh, London Derry in January 1972, subsequently known as Bloody Sunday. So up until that point, violence emanated from two principal uh, uh, armed fringes of the nationalist and unionist communities. On the one hand, you had the IRA, which of course had split into two opposing wings, the officials and the provisionals. Uh, and uh, 
in, in the beginning, of course, uh, that was uh, that violence was um, aimed at defending Catholics from Protestant attacks. Though it later progressed into a broader strategic objective of seeking a British withdrawal from Northern Ireland. Tactically, what it looked like was um, open gun battles with the police and army, as well as involvement, involvement in rioting. By 1972, the Provisionals were emerging as a force to be reckoned with, uh, though they divided their attacks between hitting security forces targets on the float, as they put it, while carrying out scores of assassinations, uh, dozens of assassinations of Protestant civilians in North and West Belfast. For Henry Patterson, great historian of the period, um, the provost represented a Faustian bargain between a Republican purism of Rory O'Brody and a rampant Northern uh, Republicanism deeply in league with sectarianism. Despite the Provisional's meteoric rise, the Unionist Prime Minister Bram Faulkner was claiming that by the end of 1971, Belfast was almost free of IRA activity and that the organisation's morale was so low um, due to the actions he took in relation to internment. <coughs> Indeed, the Army had been boasting uh, of the IRA's demise <coughs> since October 1971, despite the organisation contributing exponentially to some 30 bomb attacks and a startling rise in the death toll a few weeks later. So that's on the one side of the divide. On the other, of course, the UVF uh, was responsible for a litany of bombings and shootings, including the, McGur the McGurk's Bar, um, <coughs> attack on the 4th of December 1971. The UVF was um, joined in the paramilitary arena by the Ulster Defence Association, a mass organisation formed in September 1971 from a number of vigil local vigilante uh, groupings. The UDA's motto uh, was Cicero's Decedent Arma Tugai, and I think that's the right pronunciation, my Latin's not very good. Um, let war yield peace, chosen to reflect the organisation's desire, ironically to see the uh, reintroduction of the law in Northern Ireland. Thomas Hennessy, uh, the historian of the period, reminds us that the UDA's aims were to establish an organisation that would be able to take over in the event of a complete breakdown of law and order and to operate as a pressure group to ensure that its policies were kept in the forefront of political activity. As Hennessy also notes, the growth of loyalist paramilitarism was related to the increasing levels of violence and the perception that the security forces could not contain violent republicanism. So the statistics for that period make for grim reading. Uh, the number of casualties incurred by the security situation by the end of 1971 was 174 dead and 2,592 people injured, an increase from 25 people dead and 811 injured in 1970. Now the army's approach, the British army's approach was uh, coercive, uh, they referred to it as counterinsurgency, um, however it would prove to be a liability. On the 30th of January 1972, a parachute regiment opened fire on the civil rights protesters, uh, killing 13 people. Simon Winchester, the Guardian's correspondent in, uh, in Northern Ireland, captured the mood best when he reported uh, the day after the tragic an inevitable doomsday situation which has been universally forecast for Northern Ireland finally arrived in Londonderry yesterday afternoon when soldiers firing into a large crowd shot and killed 13 civilians. Uh, after the shooting which lasted for about 25 minutes in and around the Roswell Flats area of the Bogside, the streets had all the appearance of the aftermath of Sharpville. In the wake of the killings, Ted Heath's government came under enormous international pressure. Brian Faulkner, who was the Unionist Prime Minister, recalled a telephone conversation with Heath in which he claimed that um, the British Prime Minister didn't regard it as a serious crisis. In fact, he thought it was just another one of a number of, of, a number of crises that they'd faced. The devastation caused in the box they prompted London, however, to seek the return of all security and policing powers from Belfast, from the storm of government in Belfast. In the coming weeks, Heath's government soon came to the realisation that the only way to end the violence was through dialogue. As he told the House of Commons on the 24th of March 1972, in a speech signalling the prorogation of Stormont, the United Kingdom government remain of the view that the transfer of this responsibility to Westminster is an indispensable condition for progress in finding a political solution in Northern Ireland. The government's decision therefore leaves them with no alternative to assuming full and direct responsibility for the administration of Northern Ireland until a political settlement 
sorry, a solution to the problems so the problems can be worked out. While the operational responsibility for the ending of violence of the violence rested with the army on the streets, uh, the political <coughs> responsibility for the region was now firmly in the hands of London. It's important to give you that background because of the um, response to that, the shock uh, and awe uh, of the fall of Stormont. It was greeted with fury by Unionists. For the first time in 50 years, they were no longer in charge. Fearing for their political future, loyalist paramilitaries soon mobilised. Bill Craig, who had been uh, on, in the cabinet of that, um, um, of, of that government at Stormont, was now leader of the Ulster Vanguard. He threatened to form a provisional government. He was joined by Ian Paisley, uh, MP for North Antrim and leader of the DUP. He questioned Heath in Parliament about his government's intentions in proroguing Stormont. So, <laughs> uh, reading back at the debates, uh, of course, Paisley being a colourful character, he actually asked a very specific question of Heath that day. Um, when he announced that Stormont would be prorogued. He asked him uh, whether the Dublin government would be consulted on the future of Northern Ireland. He sidestepped that, uh, the issue of an Irish dimension. This would have serious consequences in the coming months as Loyalists attended mass rallies presided over by both Paisley and Craig. At the end of May 1972, thousands of masked men organised in the companies, three abreast, according to the newspapers at the time, and displaying well-disciplined order were parading along the shackle to a huge rally in Woodfield Park. Explosions could be heard in the distance as those lining the streets cheered on the men. The reality was that the ab in the absence of local democracy, an escalation in IRA attacks and intercommunal strife, loyalist paramilitary groups flourished. So Ted Heath believed that direct rule would uh, only be temporary until a political solution was worked out. Talks were convened in Darlington uh, in September 1972 aimed at delivering that policy. However, they were limited. Only Unionists, the Alliance Party and the Northern Ireland Labour Party attended, with the SDLP boycotting talks due to internment. After Darlington, the Guardian newspaper spearheaded <coughs> calls for a power-sharing settlement between Unionists and Nationalists. The army alone cannot win peace, said the Guardian. Uh, the attitude of the Catholic community remains crucial. For that reason alone, internment must be ended as soon as possible. But it is even more important to demonstrate positively to the Catholics that they are to have a guaranteed and effective, and effective, effective role in the new politics. In a community as divided as this, coalition administration is needed. The Guardian bemoaned the fact that Unionists had demonstrated uh, indifference on the matter. Though as historian Gordon Gillespie later noted, we must take into account the psychological and political shock that the fall of Stormont represented for Unionists. They didn't believe that they needed to compromise majority rule for minor minority aspirations. In many respects, the Guardian's suggestion that Unionists <coughs> trade power for security was a moot point, especially in light of the mass mobilisation of loyalist paramilitaries now underway. I think it's important um, because I'm, I'm going to focus on the UDA because that's a principal key actor uh, in um, bringing down the power sharing executive in 1974. But I think it's important just to give you a little snapshot of how powerful the organisation was uh, in 1972 within a year of being formed. An example um, comes from a secret meeting between Tommy Hearn, its leader in East Belfast, Put that one up there for the moment. And the British Army's General Officer Commanding, Harry Tuzo, the Senior British Intelligence Officer, Frank Steele, and the former Secretary of the Northern Ireland Cabinet, Sir Harold Black. The meeting was held at Stormont. It was convened to address complaints about the deterioration in relations between the Army and the Loyalists in East Belfast. Tuzo refuted the allegations that the Army had been deliberately provocative towards the local Protestant population. It must be understood, he told the Loyalists, that the army could hardly be to blame for the recent incident since it simply was not in their interest to be engaged in East Belfast when they could be better employed dealing with the IRA. In his opinion, he would be prepared to withdraw from East Belfast entirely were it not for the need to protect isolated Catholic communities which saw themselves as being under continual threat of violence from their Protestant neighbours. Heron uh, challenged Tuzo to prove that the army was truly impartial 
making the case that the Royal Green Jackets had come from another area and were behaving, in his uh, words, uh, like conquering heroes. Uh, and they'd overreacted uh, to the relatively slight disorders they had encountered from the Tartan gangs. As Heron made clear in the meeting, it would be unprofitable of these two forces to confront one another as enemies. Rather, Heron believed that the UDA and the army should be seen to be getting along together and talking. It was clear in the meeting that all concerned wished to maintain positive relations. The meeting confirmed that the army had already uh, what the, the army had already said earlier in the summer. So the meeting took place in October, uh, but earlier in the summer, when it narrowly avoided conflict with the UDA in East, uh, sorry, in West Belfast, the security forces remained responsible for law and order in this area. Said the army. Uh, in Lisburn, but it has to be agreed that unarmed UDA men may come and go, provided they do not interfere with the local population or with the security forces. Now, the reaction from the Catholic community was swift, and representatives from the SDLP uh, accused the army of colluding with loyalists. Now, loyalists killed um, approximately 117 people in 1972. Republicans were sp responsible for 264 deaths, <coughs> with British security forces killing 45 people. So the vast majority of the violence, of course, was emanating from the IRA. The UDA also remained legal. Many of the group's violent actions were carried out, as we later, as it later transpired, under the banner of the Ulster Freedom Fighters, so as to maintain a distance between the UDA's commitment to law and order and local pressures exerted upon its leadership to do something to defend Protestant communities. 1972, of course, was the high point of the Troubles. There were a total of 10,631 shooting incidents, along with 1,382 bombings and 471 devices neutralised, most of them by Army technical officers. Uh, the academic Sarah Nelson observed that the disruption of normal law and order plus soaring of relations with the Army and the police as conflict grew between loyalists and the state, gave violent men a simple, practical advantage, leeway for their actions. So that's just a snapshot of how powerful the UDA had become at that point. 1973 signalled a move towards uh, realising the British government's ambitions to, uh, <coughs> to create a local solution to the problem. The publication of Northern Ireland constitutional proposals uh, on the 20th of March I'll give you a little bit of a timeline here, uh, in which an assembly was proposed, was followed by elections on the 28th of June and the formation of a power sharing executive on the 21st of November. The conference at Sunningdale was aimed at agreeing the practical mechanics of the deal between Faulknerite Unionists and the SDLP, led by Jerry Fitt. The agreement also proposed the Council of Ireland, which gave Do Dublin a consultative role, something loyalists have been concerned about since the fall of Stormont. In addition to the Irish I mentioned there were nine clauses relating to security, <coughs> and in fact I've written recently about this in a very expensive book, Harry, you'll be pleased to know, uh, <laughs> which has been edited by David McCann of Slither and uh, Kelly McGrattan at uh, Ulster University on Sunning Deal. And in fact, um, the, um, <coughs> what, what I found in, in that research looking at the security dimension was that uh, the, the clauses on security were designed with the explicit intention of bolstering British attempts to contain the violence. Apart from entertaining notions of an all-Ireland court, which would enjoy jurisdiction over both parts of the island, the agreement also envisaged scaling back the military role while returning the province to normal policing. That didn't actually happen until 1976-77 when police primacy came back in, but there were early attempts to try and rest control of the security situation away from the military. Um, British politicians, can, you know, depending on what history books you read, they, they, are very, they were always very nervous about giving the military uh, relief and uh, with good reason. Uh, in an attempt to stop the violence, the British government sought a more robust legislative <coughs> framework, placing power sharing on an Irish dimension at its core. Francis Pym, uh, Northern Ireland Minister outlined this new policy in Parliament on the 13th of December after summing deal. Throughout these difficult years, he told MPs, it has always been said that a solution lay in a two pronged approach a vigorous onslaught against the terrorists coupled with political advance. That political advance uh, will shortly be a reality. So the um, power sharing executive comes in 
uh, on the, uh, the 1st of January 1974. Many people in the community saw the executive as a useful experiment, according to uh, Paddy Devlin, who was the health minister at the time, which in his view re uh, presented a real alternative to violence. Nevertheless, a large number of loyalists, said Devlin, were quite indifferent to the phenomenon of having people who were regarded as Catholics on the executive and in charge of government departments. In light of loyalist hostility, Faulkner's position would be continually weakened over the next four months until the Ulster Unionist Council voted narrowly against supporting Sunningdale. Faulkner remained chief executive, though at the head of a deeply divided party. On the 14th of May, the executive commended the agreement to the Assembly, which defeated an anti power sharing motion by 44 votes to 28. Loyalist Assembly members present, present reportedly jeered Faulkner with shouts of no to United Ireland, never, and of course, no surrender. Uh, Faulkner beat a hasty retreat from the chamber. In the wake of the vote, Harry Murray, <coughs> chairman of the previously unknown Ulster Workers' Council, issued a statement calling for a general strike to begin with immediate attack. Just to give you an idea, I mean, it's quite, quite a quiet um, day, actually. Uh, this is the Army's um, sort of situation report for the security situation, which, which um, comes from the National Archives. Uh, Army headquarters in Lisbon reported a generally quiet night. Uh, in the preceding 24 hours, there were only four shooting incidents, with shots fired at soldiers in the Beach Mountain Falls areas. Two civilians were slightly hurt when an ammunition technical officer carried out a controlled explosion on the Albert Bridge when another neutralised the booby trap car in Kingsbridge. In other incidents, a bomb exploded beside a passing army patrol in the Glen Road area of Derry, London Derry, with several shots uh, fired in Ardenmoyle Park and sporadic stoning incidents in Craigan. Sometimes never change. Outside of the city's uh, culvert bomb exploded. I can't, I can't even pronounce the name of the place. Clontogra. There's my best attempt. While a rifle was discovered in Armagh and a motor bomb in Cushendall. Overall, though, there were a few signs of trouble in loyalist districts. So quiet, unusual. So in the, f the morning, uh, on the morning, the first morning of the, the strike, uh, by now the U uh, UWC were repeating their calls for people to support the strike. In response, the trade union movement acted quickly to keep what they called destructive politics off the shop floor. However, the powerful emotional rhetoric uh, by loyalist politicians contributed to a fraught situation. Andy Barr, the district uh, secretary of the Sheet Metal Workers and Coppersmiths Union, <coughs> pleaded with his 2,500 workers to report for work. Most did until lunchtime when workers at Harlan and Wood Shipyard were threatened that their cars would be burnt if they did not walk out immediately. Later that day, loyalists sailed off the port town of Larne. Um, the tardy response uh, to the strike had left the UWC with a strategic choice. Either they could mobilise everyone, uh, ev everything at their disposal, including the paramilitaries, or risk the stoppage becoming a failure before it even got off the ground. Anyone who picked up the Times newspaper on the 16th of May 1974 would have been greeted by a mix of international and national headlines. There's really troops in action in Lebanon. The uncertain future of Rhodesia. Clydeside workers define their trade union to continue to build ships for the fascist junta in Chile. On the right hand side of the front page, however, was dispatch from the newspaper's correspondent in Belfast, Bob Fisk, noting how a strike called by this shadowy organisation known as the UWC threatened to bring Ulster to a standstill. Fisk informed his readers, it seemed last night as if loyalists were intent on creating once again the old idiot, Illy, I can't even pronounce this word, um, uh, let's just say threatening the British authorities in order to ensure that they remained British. The paradox, um, the very British rebels um, aspect is, is of course um, what uh, what was being relayed in newspapers. Commenting on the UWC's actions, the Minister of Manpower, uh, Robert Cooper, told reporters, I think it will rebound on loyalist leaders who give it support. They will lose support as a result. 
Later that evening, UWC risked further alienating their base um, by um, ordering strikers to come off the drink. Followed, this followed an intervention by the wives of the strikers um, who said that their husbands were losing money and they had no time to spend down the pub. Consequently, pubs in areas like the Shankill Newton Arch Road were closed. Uh, however, there was uh, one incident actually that would have strategic um, a strategic effect on the relationship between the UDA and UVF, which we can talk about later on, um, where there is a shooting incident um, when um, uh, between the two organisations uh, that uh, that would poison relations probably for the, for the rest of the 1970s. Um, but pubs in Catholic areas reported a brisk trade. So I don't know if that was people crossing the barricades for a time, but I suppose, I suppose that's what the historians are saying when they look at that. Um, I'll leave you to work out what you think. Uh, nothing, nothing wrong with cross-community drinking. The British Labour Party came out, as the government of course in London, came out against the stoppage and used all its power and influence through the Northern Ireland Labour Movement to persuade workers mm -hmm. not to back the strike. Indeed, a local branch of the NILP in Newton Abbey had even called on the police to arrest Bill Craig. They condemned the intimidation of workers, asking people to come forward with information. However, when television cameras interviewed a female employee of Careers, she told reporters that when she did just that, the RUC said that she should, quote unquote, accept a certain amount of intimidation. The local NILP branch said that if the strike continued in the into the following week, the RUC and army should be used uh, and should be uh, present in force outside the gates of all the industrial sites. <coughs> the Wilson government resisted the temptation to use force to break the strike, believing that it risked provoking a bloodbath and, as I've outlined in relation to the army's compromise with the UDA, uh, it would open up another front. Um, that they weren't prepared to do, and the archives support that. Uh, in fact, uh, it's the note that was written by Merlin Rees, the Secretary of State, after the strike, uh, he uh, makes that very clear. What he, does, what he did do was he, he wrote a note on the short-term implications of the strike and the long-term, and now we have access to that. We can actually see what you know, the top British officials were thinking and they believed that it would risk a bloodbath, but what they weren't prepared to do was um, to, to not back, they, they were backing the executive because they didn't want to return, in the words of the British, uh, 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 British cabinet, uh, a return to a Protestant state for a Protestant people. So even though they, they um, you know, blood, um, even though a bloodbath, they, they wanted to ensure that that didn't happen, Blood flowed on the evening of the 17th of May. Reports filtered in its newsrooms across Ireland and uh, Great Britain of a series of explosions in Dublin and later Morton. No warnings were issued. Both wings of the IRA as well as the UDA were first out of the stocks to condemn the explosions and the UVF remained silent. In fact, the UVF remained silent for almost 20 years. No matter. Interestingly, Republican spokesman said that it bore all the hallmarks of an SAS-style operation. There can be no doubt that those involved in the bombings had been ex-servicemen rather than um, necessarily uh, still in uniform, who formed uh, the nucleus of uh, an elite within the UVF. I've written about that, of course. Republicans like Rory O'Brady and Maliki Toll were quick to link the explosions to the ongoing strike in the north. And this is kind of a, a, interesting because, of course, they supported that. They saw that as a, an awakening of a class consciousness amongst Protestant workers that they could overthrow, they could defy their leaders. But after the explosions, they, um, they were in two minds of the issue. Apart from speculation over which loyalist group was responsible, the UWC was still attempting to shut down the power plants, which would be achieved by midnight. Only one section of the Bally Lumford power plant remained operational, while the Derry um, Kilkirig uh, station had closed down altogether. A bomb blast at the cross border interconnector on the 8th of February had still not been repaired, leaving the ball in the UWC's court. Merlin Reese still remained adamant that he wouldn't talk to the strikers. Uh, 
as he told, as Berlin Reese, uh, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, told the press conference that the provisional IRA had tried to bomb its way to the conference table. Now people were trying to strike their way to the conference table. Either way, it's not on. Uh, Glenn Barr called Reese's stance ultra, uh, utterly irresponsible, suggesting that it was an absolute nonsense to suggest that the UWC was trying to blackmail the government. By the 20th of May, electricity output had dropped to one third across Northern Ireland. The British responded by authorising the deployment of an additional 500 troops. However, it had uh, now been recognised by the press, if not by the NIO, that the uh, UWC represented a clear political challenge to uh, London's plans to foist some of the on the religious community. And you can see the um, newspaper report from the time. How Wilson's speech on the 25th of May gave the UWC the greatest upsurge in support, you can see the timeline there, by referring to the strikers as spongers, Wilson exposed both his ignorance and arrogance of the situation they go measure. Despite further deployments of troops, the Labour government could not enforce its will on the UWC, and on the 28th of May, Bram Faulkner resigned, triggering the collapse of the first sharing executive. Reeves remained defiant. On the 31st of May, he sat at the head of a press conference at Stormont. Although he denied that the stoppage had the overwhelming support of the Protestant community, he did acknowledge the new spirit of Ulster nationalism now blowing through the province. However, when Reeves came to address Parliament in a special emergency sitting on the 3rd of June 1974, he was in combatant mood. He said on the 14th of May, the Ulster Workers' Council called a strike in the province. He told the MPs, this group is a non-elected body of men that sought to subvert the express wish and authority to this parliament through unconstitutional and undemocratic means involving widespread intimidation. One Conservative MP likened events to the minor strikes, um, which was a... Uh, which was a dig, of course, at the Labour, um, Labour uh, Minister Rees. Rees refuted it on the basis that they never used guns, the <coughs> miners never used guns, concentrating his gaze on the attacks of three pubs in a fish and ship shop, not to mention the murders of two Catholic brothers at the White Side Halt. He said that the Balamine incident demonstrated the violent forces which emerge and are a, consequences, a consequence of a strike of this nature. So, that, that takes uh, the uh, timeline up to the fall of the executive. In the aftermath, uh, the an unlikely supporter um, of the principal of the strike was Professor <coughs> Corey at Queen's University in Belfast. He uh, wrote a letter to the Times newspaper um, almost two years later, uh, reminding readers how the strike was not called as a protest action for power sharing but because of what he termed the disastrous Sunningdale Agreement between Mr Heath and Mr Cosgrove in December 1973, which inter alia would have given the government of the Republic an indirect role in the delicate area of policing in Northern Ireland, because the electorate of Northern Ireland were not afforded the opportunity to approve uh, the new constitutional arrangements. This is important, I think, because it casts the strike and stoppage in a different light. It underscores the democratic will of the people being flexed in a completely alternative manner. In terms of its uh, mandate for strike action, the Westminster election of February 1974, Con O'Leary maintained, was skillfully converted by the Loyalist Coalition into a plebiscite on Sunningdale. Sunny, uh, Dublin is only Sunningdale away, <coughs> was the, the, the slogan. The share of the vote increased from 36.5% in 1973 to 51.5%. It was that election, O'Leary said, rather than the strike three months later that spelled the downfall of the executive. Now, academics are generally sceptical about the merits of the Sunning Deal Agreement. I'll come back to that. Um, you can see here Gordon Gillespie. Uh, he said, during the, the strike itself, the situation developed whereby Samuel Johnson famously remarked, when a man knows he is going to be hanged in a fortnight, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. And what that, uh, what that showed is that there, there was an ability within the uh, unionist and loyalist community to unite against this. In fact, uh, with the fall of Stormont, the first rally on that weekend that Stormont had been paroled, there were over 100,000 people uh, made their way up to Stormont. So it just shows that, that actually this was a, a large community um, and 
<coughs> wasn't necessarily the will of the majority of the people in Northern Ireland. It represented the majority of the people in the Protestant unions, loyalist communities, we'd say today. So, um, yes, uh, generally, when we look at uh, something deal as a missed opportunity, uh, historians like Gordon Gillespie are sceptical, arguing that neither unionists nor nationalists at large were prepared to make the compromises <coughs> necessary to make such a political settlement work. Stephen Wolfe, who is a professor of political scientist, argues that the agreement was not a treaty between two states, but an, ag an agreement reached between two states and a selected number of political parties. In order for it to work, to have worked, he contends, it would have required substantial support for those partners in the agreement who were most qualified to pressures from their own <coughs> communities. So the legacy of the strike, just in closing, um, 45 years ago, Northern Ireland saw its best chance of a power-sharing settlement thwarted by the inclusion of an Irish dimension, which was rejected by the vast majority of unions. Today, power-sharing is once again thwarted for other reasons, namely the political corruption attached to renewable energy scheme. However, this is merely the manifestation of something more deeply ingrained that we cannot ignore, and which this historical episode um, allows us a kind of window uh, to look through into the past, and that is the lack of trust between the two communities, which has been reinforced by the political architecture designed to manage this deeply divided place under the <coughs> Belfast Free Friday Agreement. It is for this reason alone that we should reflect, reflect on the significance <coughs> of past attempts to resolve the dispute. The absence of trust between unions and nationals has, of course, been complicated by recent developments such as the flag protests and the decision by the UK to leave the European Union. In many ways, these challenges have been accentuated by the resurgence of militancy within both loyalism and republicanism, where violence has intersected with criminality in some cases and the growth of populist nationalism. While there's much to be said for these developments, I just want to concentrate on a couple of points um, that, that emerge out of what Glenn Barr told the conference at Queen's University in Belfast in 2014 I was lucky to attend. Uh, and, um, and, and hopefully these will open up uh, some discussion. Now the first point to make is, uh, for me really, to, to, be, to give you the unvarnished uh, view of, of what I think is, has happened um, in relation to power sharing and the unions and loyalist communities. The famous quip by Seamus Mallon, Sunning, Sunningdale, Good Friday Agreement, Sunningdale for Slow Learners demonstrates, in my personal opinion, a paucity of generosity or understanding of the political philosophy of Ulster Unionism and the gravitational pull felt by loyalists for the British identity. Now, it's a very um, academic way of saying something um, quite blunt. But um, Sarah Campbell, a, story, a historian um, of the period and of the SNLP, is <coughs> While many of the elements of the Good Friday Agreement looked like those at Sunningdale, the concepts of both power sharing and the Irish dimension were of very different complexions in 1998 than they were in 1974. By 1998, Loyalist grassroots parties were proving electorally viable in their support for the Belfast Agreement. To uh, Progressive Unionist Party politician David Irvine, the new assembly represented the will of the people. In his first contribution to the elected assembly in 98, Irvine talked of a new dy dynamic in the politics of Northern Ireland, noting how some 71.12% of the people voted in favour of the agreement. That should be 71.1. Anyway, uh, Irvine lambasted those who he said um, accused everyone else of not being Democrats, uh, and then by their actions, language and attitude, challenged the single most important democratic decision that has ever been taken in Northern Ireland. Now fast forward. 20 years, and uh, Irvine's colleague, Billy Hutchinson, was sounding a more despondent note when he told the Irish Times on the uh, 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. I don't think we've moved on in the last 20 years. I think we actually went backwards. We never had shared responsibility, because no matter who is in power, the two largest parties carve things up, and that's not good for society. It shouldn't be a case of a penny for me and a penny for you, a pound for you, a pound for me, a million for you, a million for me. It should be about dealing with the issues that matter to everyone. Now, Hutchison's uh, articulation of a sense of loyalist disempowerment <coughs> has been taken up by academics like David McCann and, and Killian McGrattan. 
And they've looked at this political uh, disaffection and they said in a book on Sunningdale, as the flag protests continue to demonstrate, issues to do with inclusion and exclusion of voice and experience remain central to debates in Northern Ireland. Discussions over procedures and trust lie at the core of studies and commentary surrounding increasing voter apathy and differing perceptions over what exactly constitutes agreement abound in contemporary developments over political uh, contemporary developments over political developments. Since the collapse of the power sharing executive in 2017, the most recent iteration, these questions uh, continue to feed into the discussion around the talks. There can be no doubt that the most significant, one of the most significant developments in recent years has been the sidelining of loyalist voices from the power sharing structures. I mean, it was Glenn Barr who relayed this kind of frustration at the conference in Queens, as you can see there. Uh, the usual problem we've always had. Uh, said Barr is that uh, ordinary working class uh, were used again. Um, they were brought out of a rabbit hole and when the dirty work was done and over and all the plaudits had been handed out, they were shoved back into the rabbit hole again. This legacy of loyalist abandonment remains acute. We see Ulster Protestants uh, represented by a dominant political party that has benefited from the collapse, arguably benefited from the collapse of two power sharing executives. That's a very controversial point, but we can talk about it. <coughs> at the same time, there's a paradox alive and well in the relationship between unionists and loyalists. On the one hand, both are determined to remain uh, to maintain the union between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but on the other hand, they compete with one another about the best way of achieving this overarching objective. So, uh, last comment uh, on uh, uh, here before um, hopefully I can open it up for discussion. It's Mark Twain who said that history does not repeat itself but often rhymes, I think, was it Mark Twain? In Northern <coughs> Ireland we might better think of history as a broken record, an insufferable song, just think of the song you hate most, stuck on repeat, you're condemned to listen to forever. As the journalist Don Anderson, who would write a book on the UWC strike, said, the greatest single cause of the success of the stoppage was the deep sense of political grievance felt by the majority Protestant community. It is this deep sense of political grievance that pervades the Union's community today. Sunningdale and the UWC strike merely acted as a lightning rod for such disaffection. Its collapse did little to resolve the underlying grievances that fueled the stoppage in the first place. Thank you very much.